All those who are holding tickets outside will get in as fast as they can. I'm speaking out to you, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm speaking to the crowd on the outside who seem to be standing rather reluctant to come in, and we're going to start this very soon. We're on to the six Academy Awards in this episode, and we wanted to look back at the previous five Best Picture winners, kind of discuss the the themes and the things that we've like hit on on these previous episodes that we've seen in the Best Picture winners and that we've observed. And this felt like an appropriate time to do it with this next Best Picture winner at the Six Academy Awards because it feels like it's an amalgamation and combination of all the previous winners who came before it. I think when we start these podcasts, we kind of want to gear into uh, either like a general theme or really just like kind of break down the best picture and how it relates moving forward and just to like our film knowledge in general. And I feel like with Calvacade, there wasn't like a specific defining feature of the movie or some sort of aspect that we can kind of dive into and dive into like the themes of it. Because, you know, we've already discussed the fiction film and nonfiction kind of contrast between making a film that's based on history. We've talked about films that deal heavily with war. You know, we've talked about these more, these films that kind of are carried by these lead actors and, you know, these films that are are taking place across such a long period of time that kind of dissect this big piece of history. So we're seeing like a little bit of repeat with Calvacade that's been different than what we've seen before at the same time. So to kind of go back and look at the previous five winners, so the first Best Picture winner went to Wings. The second Academy Award for Best Picture went to The Broadway Melody. The third went to All Quiet on the Western Front. The fourth went to Cimarron. The fifth Academy Award for Best Picture went to Grand Hotel. And then the sixth Academy Award or Oscar for Best Picture went to Cavalcade. And the reason why I emphasize Oscar is because this year was the first time that the term Oscar was used or at least written down, depending on who you ask in the history. And that goes to Sidney Skolsky, who wrote it in his New York Daily News article uh, after the Academy Awards had finished. He had famously written down, the Academy Awards met with the approval of Hollywood, there being practically no dissension. The Academy went out of its way to make the results honest and announced that balloting would continue until 8 o'clock of the banquet evening. Then many players arrived late and demanded the right to vote. So voting continued until 10 o'clock, or two hours after the ballot boxes were supposed to be closed. It was King Vider who said this year the election is on the level, which caused everyone to comment about the other years. Although Catherine Hepburn wasn't present to receive her Oscar, her constant companion and the gal she resides with in Hollywood, Laura Harding, was there to hear Hepburn get a round of applause for a change. So the famous story is that Skolsky forgot how to even write down the word statuette and referred to it as an Oscar. Where that term comes from, it can be debated by many people, but it has now become, you know, the big name for whenever we talk about the Academy Awards is the Oscars. It's always the Oscars this, the Oscar that, Oscar worthy kind of playing into our title. So, John, like, how do you feel about that now we're finally using that term Oscar and it wasn't even being used before? Yeah, I think when you start to see like nicknames, what it reminds me a lot is in the modern day, when you start to see like memes in culture, you know, something's like becoming very relevant in terms of pop culture and in the same way when i think about um like nicknames when you're starting to see like nicknames for awards whether it's specific categories or the actual academy and the ceremony called the oscars as well as the actual statue so i think this marks a significant moment in oscars history or the academy awards history where we're starting to see these nicknames and these play-ups of uh the actual statue that we're giving out and awarding people the fact that it's kind of breaking down and becoming a significant part in not only like film history, but also the entire cultural zeitgeist of the entertainment industry as a whole, but also across America and across the entire world. I think we're starting to see just a more understanding of what these awards stand for and the significance. And I think that starts with these little insider things that can spread to the world in the way that uh, we simply call the Academy Awards the Oscar, yet it's also the award itself is the Oscar. I think it's just showing how important these awards are becoming. And I think looking back at it now, it kind of gives us a good breakdown. When we look back at these last five films, I think about why they won Best Picture, why they are at the top of the list here. And I think what we can sum up a lot of these is that there's a lot of common themes. You know, Ben has a TVR major. I have like a film major background. And when we discuss pictures or films that relate to a lot of people, you want to open up a film and kind of 
present something that's very relatable that anyone could kind of digest but still understand, even if it's not from their specific background. So when looking at a picture like Wings or All Quiet on the Western Front, we have really just a 15 years after the first war. It's a lot of people still fresh on their minds. It's something that they can easily relate to. They've either lost people or they've been in the war themselves. And then from other films, you know, from Grand Hotel and Simmering, we're seeing like a, a wealth in race separation between the gaps of wealth and race that like a lot of people could relate to either on the wealthy side or that's just a struggling from poverty level to kind of become better than what you were previously, I guess, is not maybe the best way to say it. But we're seeing these commonality themes in all these five films. So Ben, what do you think about these kind of themes or the overall kind of storylines that we've seen in the past five films? Why do you think they've won Best Picture? Yeah, I I think they won Best Picture because it it tugs on to the I want to say the heartstrings of people, and that's more just because of the the drama and the tension that World War One had caused, and even the Great Depression had caused, because we're we're coming out of that era of history. And so when Cavalcade comes around, it it's that again that it combines all those those themes of war, of love lost, of family lost, of even love gained, and it it presents all those themes in one film, whereas the previous five winners. It was it was spread out, yeah. Wings and All Quiet on the Western Front dealt with war, but when it's all being presented in one film, and I think that that's what makes it impactful for an audience to take in, because now you're hitting on those exact themes. You're getting a a, a, a telling of history in Cavalcade, which is similar to the story structure of Cimarron, and you're also getting a glimpse into this high life of society that you would get in Grand Hotel that kind of makes the common middle class or lower class people who are mostly going to the cinema at this time being like, whoa, like, look at them, look what they have. That isn't that so flashy. Or it it makes it even relatable because, because no one is safe from the terrors of war or from death and destruction and, and just how time can just take you on. And, and so that's why I feel like Cavalcade is successful, but also it's standing on what was given before and actually doesn't necessarily advance a Best Picture winner and what it can do for pop culture and society. Looking at the film back in history, it's probably experienced and was experienced very differently, and that's probably why it is the Best Picture here. And we'll get into more of the specifics of whether we think it's worthy or not, but I think Calvacate also hits to the way that Grand Hotel does, where it's not only the showing the extreme wealthy side of things and kind of making that relatable, but it's also a contrast between wealth and the lower class. And with Grand Hotel, you have Lionel Barrymore's character who's on his last kind of legs of life and he's poor and he's kind of contrasting with this higher up, uh, very rich man. And you see the same kind of dynamic with Cavalcade where it's from the perspective of the help staff as well as the very rich homeowners in England. So it's also carrying over that difference in comparison. But I think that's more so just to have a wider audience, you know, both the upper class as well as middle and lower class can relate to this film simply because you have that representation and you have that uh, understanding that you can relate to these characters. You can certainly relate to them uh, from a personal level and a domesticated life. And to touch once more upon the history aspect of it, you know, with Wings, with Jack and David, you know, Jack came from more of a middle class, you know, lifestyle and David a more upper class one. And then in Cavalcade, uh, the two main families, one lower and one upper class, both went into the wars together and you see how they kind of came out of it in, in different ways than wings, but still having that lasting impact uh, as well. So it's very interesting how a best picture can 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 take in a, a, again a general feeling of of an audience of a country and of a nation, but then again be able to touch upon things that normally wouldn't be touched upon in just regular conversation. And that leads me to my next question for John: Is is Cavalcade worthy of the best picture award of nineteen thirty two thirty three? So welcome back to Worthy, Episode 6. Today we are going to be talking about the Best Picture winner of 1932-33, Cavalcade. And we felt it was no better way to start it than opening with the title card that you see at the beginning of the film. This is the story of a home and a family. History seen through the eyes of a wife and a mother whose love tempers both fortune and disaster. As 1899 ends, 
England is at war with the Boers in South Africa, but the tide of battle is against her. It is a national emergency, New Year's Eve. Our London family, sheltered through two generations of Victorian prosperity, awaits the headlong cavalcade of the 20th century. On New Year's Eve, 1899, upper-class couple Jane and Robert Marriott return to their London townhouse to keep their tradition of toasting to the new year. Jane is worried because Robert has joined the City of London Imperial Volunteers as an officer and will soon be leaving to serve in the Second Boer War, where Jane's brother is already fighting. The Marriott's butler, Alfred Bridges, has joined the CIV as a private and will also be leaving soon. His wife Ellen and her mother, Mrs. Snapper, are worried about what will become of Ellen and their baby Fanny if Alfred is killed or seriously wounded in action. But Alfred remains optimistic. At midnight, the Marriott and Bridges families toast to the new century. Shortly thereafter, Jane and Ellen bid emotional farewells to their husband as they leave on the same ship. Jane's friend, Margaret Harris, keeps her company and supports her while Robert is away. While the two women are attending an operetta, the relief of Mafeking is announced from the stage, and the audience cheers. Robert and Alfred return home, and the former is knighted for his services. Alfred announces that he has bought a pub of money partly provided by Robert, and that he and Ellen will be leaving service and moving to a flat, along with Fanny and Mrs. Snapper. As the downstairs staff celebrates Alfred's return, they receive news of the death of Queen Victoria. In 1908, Alfred has become an alcoholic and is managing the pub poorly spending the family's rent money on drinks. Ellen and Fanny are embarrassed by Alfred's behavior. Ellen carefully plans a social evening when Jane and her son Edward, now attending the University of Oxford, visits the Bridges flat. Ellen does not tell Alfred about the visit and lies to the Marriotts that he cannot attend due to a leg injury. However, just as the Marriotts are leaving, Alfred shows up at the house drunk, acts rudely, and destroys a doll that Jane has given Fanny. Fanny runs out into the street, An angry Alfred goes after her, only to be run over and killed by a horse-drawn fire engine. On July 25th, 1909, Ellen and Fanny encounter the Marriotts at the seaside, where Ellen explains that she now owns the pub and she and Fanny, who has become a talented dancer and singer, are living off its proceeds. Edward has fallen in love with his childhood playmate, Edith Harris. The family witnesses the historic flight by Louise Blario over the English Channel. In April 1912, Edward and Edith marry and spend their honeymoon aboard a luxurious ocean liner revealed to be the ill-fated RMS Titanic. In 1914, World War I breaks out. Robert and Joe, the Marriott's other son, both serve as officers believing the war will be over in a few months. While on leave, Joe encounters Fanny, whom he remembers from their childhood, performing in a nightclub. He reintroduces himself to her and they bond while witnessing a Zeppelin air raid on London from the rooftop. Fanny later becomes a star of a theatrical production. Fanny and Joe fall in love. Unbeknownst to his parents, he spends most of his leave time with her. He finally proposes, but she hesitates to accept because of their class difference. Just after the armistice is announced in 1918, Ellen, who has found out about Fanny and Joe's affair, visits Jane and reveals a relationship to her. She demands that Joe marry Fanny when he returns. Jane is surprised but refuses to meddle in her son's personal life. As the two women argue, Jane receives a telegram informing her that Joe has been killed in battle and faints. Later, a grief-stricken Jane walks sadly and silently through armistice celebrations in Trafalgar Square. Following the war, montage shows daily life become even more chaotic and the social order being further disrupted, while some advocate that mankind works towards peace. The film ends on New Year's Day 1933 with Jane and Robert, now elderly, carrying on their tradition of celebrating the new year with a midnight toast to their past memories as well to the future. Cavalcade stars Diana Winyard as Jane Marriott, Clive Brooke as Robert Marriott, Una O'Connor as Ellen Bridges, Herbert Munden as Alfred Bridges, Frank Lawton as Joe Marriott, Ursula Jeans as Fanny Bridges, Margaret Lindsay as Edith Harris, John Warburton as Edward Marriott. Cavalcade is directed by Frank Lloyd, written by Reginald Berkeley, based on the play by Noel Coward, produced by Frank Lloyd and Winfield R. Sheehan. Music by Peter Brunelli, Luis De Francesco, Arthur Lang, 
and J.S. Zamachik. Cinematography by John F. Scheitz. Film editing by Margaret Clancy. All right, Ben. So this film takes place from 1899 all the way till 1933. Where do you want to start with Cavalcade? Is there a time we could talk about after Cavalcade? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, just to kind of give like a a very just like brief overall feel of the film, it it's not great. It's for at least for me, the film does goes through history and it points out these big historical moments in England's history, not necessarily American history. And a lot of it's more just the characters' reactions to it and like a brief way of how like their lives were changed by it. But by no means is there any kind of significance to any of these moments uh, outside of maybe two, which is where Edward and Joey die that are like truly impactful and lasting within the film for the characters. This is a very odd film for me, the same way that Grand Hotel was. It's just very, I don't want to say poorly constructed because it tells the story in a very precise kind of linear way where we do see the history of England from 1899 to 1933, but it's also told from the home perspective, you know, very much from the female perspective for the people that stayed at home from the upper class as well as the lower class that was originally the help for this family. But it's very poorly constructed when it comes to the actual storylines because it's really just, it almost feels like small little short films kind of like pieced together. You know, there's storylines that are kind of just kind of picked up out of nowhere and then just immediately killed just because it's like, oh, this was a big event that happened. Isn't this cool? Like the way we kind of piece the story into this big event. So to me, the way I first described it to Ben was like, it's half like history channel documentary, half fiction film you know that's trying to tell this history throughout england it's just this weird kind of mix up of fiction and non-fiction storytelling to kind of cohesively like sew together a narrative throughout the entire history you're definitely right with that it's a mixture of of non-fiction and, and history and and fiction as well but the problem is, is that the fictional aspects of it are very it's it's boring and like none of the dialogue really has like a huge impact on what's going on it's just kind of a reaction to things. And those reactions aren't anything grand or philosophical. It's just like, oh, yeah, look at that. Like that happened. Or like, oh, yeah, you know, our child died because of this. But not even that has like a full, you know, um, emotions behind that. And I actually feel like that's because of the acting of the film, which I found to be poor and um, just not great at all. And I, and I think that really has to sit on the shoulders of the main actress and the, the main star of the film. Sire Win Winard, uh, who played Jane, uh, the mother of the Marriott family. She started as like a stage actor and a play actress, and it just it did not translate well into film. Yeah, I think that goes for the entire film, really. To me, yeah. it, it wasn't an issue more so the acting, but more so the script. The way the script is still so in line with what you are kind of are used to with a play. I mean, this is a screenplay based off of a play by uh, Noel Callward, and it's very obvious that this is, you know, directly from a play. It still feels like a play at a lot of the, the moments throughout the film. You know, there's these big grandiose lines of dialogue where Jane, the, the main mother, who's really the lead of the entire film, which you don't really realize that until like maybe the third act. But uh, she just has these huge, long speeches where she's like talking essentially to the audience. Like she's facing the camera, but looking off like she's almost looking to the stage that's just not there. So yeah, it could be like her performance, but I, it also feels like the issue is at the script level. It just doesn't feel like a film script. It feels still like a play. And that kind of also makes sense the way this film talks about all these big events in history. You know, we have like the Titanic, we have World War One, we all have all these big moments throughout England's history. And that's what the film is trying to represent. Yet it never really shows them. We get like such small images of the Titanic. We get such small glimpses of the war. And that makes sense coming from a play's point of view. You know, you can't show this big battlefield where you can have all these people fighting and you can't show this huge Titanic sink. And it's just not physically possible on a small stage. So it, you want to take that play and make it domestic and really s like squish it down to a, a more of a reactionary piece of work where you're reacting to these big events. But really, when you're making a film you want to watch, you want to experience it through images. Like, that's not a, f a very entertaining way to experience history. Yeah, she definitely does uh, use those, like, same 
stage philosophies rather than like a philosophy a film actor would take to a performance. Uh, she definitely plays to the rafters in a lot of scenes. All the characters do, but her specifically, because she's constantly like looking up, like like almost at the camera, but just enough where she's not looking directly into the camera. And it's just so distracting because you can feel that she's taking her prior experience and her work and letting that kind of take over into her performance. And it's very, it's like almost staccato. Like there, she's hitting the right beats, but the beats are just so planned out that you're like, okay, like I get like anyone can do it like this. You're not like delivering a performance that, that truly transcends or that truly changes the feelings of a scene. You're just delivering the lines. And so that emotion, the emotional aspect of that is like taken away um, because it, because it's obvious like what they're trying to play to, but it doesn't even sound right. It doesn't even feel right because the performances are just so bland and very again very play like and just it's nothing that's like free flowing or or you at a, and at a visual standpoint nothing great cuz you know you definitely want the actors and actresses to to do something you know with their physical body movements and and do more with that but when you watch the film they're just standing there and talking and like holding their glasses of champagne or like in their very nice fancy clothes and it's very hard to feel sympathetic when the scenes when they are feeling those emotional moments and even when the actors and actresses are dealing with emotional moments their emotions are just not good they just don't do anything to make you believe that they're truly feeling emotional you can just tell that they're forcing it in there yeah a lot of her character is it's hard to say woe is me because you know this is a character who's had both of her sons die who's been through world war one her husband's made it through and seen a lot of like tragedy and horror but at the same time you don't really feel it uh, not only because you don't see the actions happening you really just get to see her experience or her really her reaction from these huge moments so it's a lot of this film is just her complaining about life and it's just like who really wants to watch this if you want to watch a character that's so bitter and just kind of against the way her life has been going like you want to at least see some resolution where there's like a kind of turn around or like turning tragedy into some sort of meaning or something greater than but it really isn't it's a lot of uh, her just being very sad and complaining about the way life is going and there's really not a lot of joy or excitement in this film it's very somber and sad which you know makes sense it's trying to hinge on world war one so much and these tragic moments in england's history but you know i still want to see some sort of like thematic ties that kind of bring it together and and make it something larger than just you know telling these histories from point a to point b so we've been really negative on the film so far here so <laughs> let's dive into something that we did like is there like a scene that you really like ben it's it's not necessarily like a scene but I, there are a few like technical things that they did do that i thought was like really interesting to watch um and one of them was the zeppelin like air raid over london so this is like the world war one aspect so it's like the third act of the film but we finally get the kind of this like big set piece and one of the things while i noticed while watching it is it felt like they were using like miniatures to pull off uh, this air raid and bombs dropping and it going over london uh, which is really cool it was very it looked very innovative for the time and 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 truly made it feel big and, and grand on a, on a scale which i think is also unfortunate because you don't get that until later into the film and even that isn't like a huge centerpiece of the film and its action. So it's just one scene in particular where they're just showing this air raid in London. Yeah, it does that a lot. The film is very kind of segmented into big moments where it's there are so many moments in this movie where it's like characters in a big parade, which makes sense when we get to the title. But there's so many moments where it's like, oh, they're going off to war. So they're celebrating. They're celebrating the end of war. Oh, they're like. They're just drinking and having like fun in, in a, on a beach where there's like a bunch of people that are like singing and dancing. You never really like feel the impact of the characters experiences through that. It just feels like random events that they just want to show you and it never kind of pieces it well together. But at the same time, those big moments, I will call them big moments because they are the biggest moments in the film. They are probably the most impactful for me. The way that we see her husband go off to war. The goodbye that uh, Clive Brooke, who's playing Robert uh, Marriott, the husband of Diana or Jane Marriott, 
and he's going off to war and there's a really cool shot where he's like saying goodbye and he's like don't look back when you when you see me go off to war and i did think that her performance diana's performance in that moment where she's kind of looking back and and doesn't want to look back because it's so sad but then she eventually does and it's like too late there's too many people and so much going on i feel like that was like an emotional moment that did really work for me um but yeah there's just not enough really tying it all together yeah that that was another that was another scene and probably the only other scene where from a technical standpoint i really enjoyed it and and from an acting standpoint too because that that exchange where uh where robert is telling her to like don't look back you know don't you know, look, because it's, it'll be too emotional for you to like look at me like waving goodbye. And that's understandable. And like a thing they did in that scene that I thought was really like haunting and added to the drama and tension was so this like happy music is like going off as they're leaving, but then you hear the horn of the boat going off too. So it's this like low, like bass, like, <laughs> you know, going off uh, in the background. And it's like going and it's drowning out all the joy and stuff. So it at, it's very ominous. Yeah, with, definitely. With like what could happen if like Robert was to die or even Alfred, but that's the thing is that there's no, there's no like payoff essentially because you know because because the, then Jane is upset for like another like scene or two after the goodbye and you you are starting to kind of feel for her but you but then all of a sudden Robert comes back and and this is also the second time I watched it so I knew Robert survived. So it was very hard for me to feel for Jane because I'm like, well, he's going to be back in like 10 minutes of film time. And it's like you're worrying about something that didn't happen and there's more to come for you to experience. And so it's really hard to like buy into her emotions, especially when the actress who plays Jane is just not very good at it. And it's just not believable. So um, so it's like a good scene, but it doesn't it's not as rewarding as if maybe if Robert had died, I would almost have rather like Robert had died in like that early scene rather than her two kids or even adding onto her two kids. Cause then the story then becomes more about Jane's experiences rather than just like this entire family's experiences with the war and, and the history of England, because then we're supposed to invest into these other characters. Cause they do give a lot of screen time to a character like Joey and Fanny. And then when you're like starting to almost care about Joey, but he is also like a little shit and he's kind of annoying and creepy. We will get to that. And, and then <laughs> it's like, you like don't even like feel bad for Jane because that the acting is so bad. And because they skip over so much of the, of the pain that you would like normally get, um, you know, a, a good example to use this and it's a totally different subject and like genre of film, but a film like boys in the hood, when, when the main character dies in the shot, you see his mother's reaction when he comes, when they bring the body back and, and you feel, you feel that visceral guttural like scream that she has when he does die. And then in cavalcade, you don't see Jane's reaction to when Edward dies of the Titanic. You only seen like a time jump, like I think it's like a year and a half or two years later where she's just kind of like sad and somber and like grief stricken. And then when Joey dies, she just like faints. And I know that can be a reaction for a lot of people. If like someone was to die suddenly, like I totally understand that. But for a film and from an acting standpoint, I kind of want my actor or actress to give some kind of emotion and some kind of like guttural, you know, emotional driven feeling behind it to their performance. Whereas with Diane uh, Winier, it's just like, Oh, I'm just going to go pass out. And then we're going to move on to the next scene. There's like no consequence to some of the things that happen, even though people do die, there's still no consequence to how the actors and actresses react to it. The fainting, I'm so glad you brought that up because that's such a specific acting choice or directing choice that, you know, it's it's something that we see in film nowadays and it's always played up as comedy. You know, like reacting or fainting from something so crazy or something so goofy or something horrible that you faint. But at this point now, it's become such a cliche that like when you look back at it, it's just like, oh, wow, you're exactly right, Ben. Like there should have been some more reaction from her because it's essentially a cop out of way of reacting. And maybe that's really dramatic at the time where you haven't seen that kind of move done over and over. And maybe it's even more dramatic when you see it on a stage in a play where you see the actual actress fall over on the hard stage and like that's her reaction. It's very intense. But at the same time, that's not that's not what I want. You know, I want something more and compelling that tells me more about her character, the way she like grieves and the way she kind of reacts from this. And you brought up the death of both sons. So not only do both of her son die, but 
we have them die in such drastically different ways. So you brought up the Titanic scene, and I definitely want to get into that because it's Edward's death in the Titanic, and then we have Joe who dies later on in World War I. But with the Titanic scene, we are essentially have a rug pulled out from under us where they're setting up this romantic kind of getaway on this boat with Edward and Edith, and they're going off essentially almost on their honeymoon. I don't know if they directly say that, I think it's um, supposed to be their honeymoon. Yeah, it's supposed to be their honeymoon, and they're having this conversation, and they're on the, sh- the 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 kind of edge of the boat, and they're overlooking the water. And then, as soon as they like walk away from that scene and walk off frame, we see that the the life kind of uh, the what do you call that a buoy? I don't even a know. A life preserver. A life, which yeah. Is, which is also kind of funny because it's a life preserver of the yeah. Titanic. Yeah. So it's like another a wink, wink, pointing at you, being like, "Ha ha! Look, look at what we threw in there." And like yeah. that's like, but that's like the whole thing of the film. It's like, oh, haha! Look, we're, look, we're referencing. Look at this. Look at that. But it's not even like anything that's actually seen or impactful, you know? Yeah. So like, they walk off frame, and we see the the life preserve that's just sitting there, right behind where they were standing, and it reveals that oh, they are on the Titanic. Like this is tragic. Like you you thought this was this beautiful rom- romantic getaway, but nope. This is like their demise. This is the end of these characters. And you're like, what? Uh, okay. And then you realize that they like don't even show the accident of the Titanic sinking. You don't even see like these characters last goodbyes to each other. All these really dramatic and compelling like story elements that would be amazing to see on film, we don't even see. We all we we barely even get a reaction from the family that the son died and his wife died. Like we just get like a random offhand line that like, yeah, the Titanic happened and they're gone. Like we don't even see the reactions to their death. It's crazy. Like who decided that was a good idea? Yeah, I, I'm not sure. And, and the thing also about that scene is that it actually has some of the best dialogue of the film, which is a little sad because it's a very like quick scene and it's by two characters that are, you spend really no time getting to know. And so the scene sort of starts out with Edith basically saying like, oh, I'd be fine dying tonight. Like she's like admitting that she's like, oh, she's really happy with Edward. And like she's kind of like feels fulfilled in her life, which like kind of works. Like if you were to like just take that scene and if you tell me like if that was like a three minute like short film, I actually think it would be a really great short film because they're talking about how they love each other and, and how they're OK with dying because they have each other. And then like it's dramatically revealed that they are about to die. But then again, when you, there's like no weight to it in the rest of the movie, because there's no like talking, talking about it and, and about them and how to like truly change their lives. It's, it's something that's like truly impactful. Um, but I did really like the dialogue and, and the ending line before uh, Edith and Edward walk away. I wanted to kind of uh, say, so Edith goes, I don't know. Oh, and Edward, I don't care. This is our moment, complete and heavenly. I'm not afraid of anything. This is our own forever. So it's like, it's really, it's really well written dialogue and it's well delivered, but you're not, it's not consistent throughout the rest of the film because of the rest of the film, the dialogue is very just matter of fact of what's going on in that day, kind of reacting to that stern event or just the family's interactions being like catching up, you know, on, on maybe the past few years, they might've missed out on talking to each other it's just it's not balanced well at all except for this one scene no you're exactly right i I even like the kind of comparison as if this was a short film and that was just like the moment in time that we kind of could make a little tiny film out of it and it is really compelling because there is just this this kind of comparison between knowing that they're going to die and also just like this beautiful moment that they're having But in this film, it's just done in such a tongue in cheek way where it it almost feels like they're poking at the audience and it's not even like a good dramatic reveal in the way they do it. And we haven't even gotten enough time to like even get to know who these characters are like moments before this scene even happens. We're just getting like their introduction to each other essentially as grownups because they skip so much in this film from time jumps uh, because it takes place over this 35 year period almost that we don't even really get to spend a lot of time with these grown up actors. And by the time they build that relationship, they're immediately destroying it off screen. So it's like, yeah, it's painful. It's just like, it's frustrating because you want to see these things happening, but they're like, Nope, they keep like holding it back behind the scenes behind the, the stage play basically. Yeah, definitely. And I think that, um, a good way to another like example of how like poorly structured and visually poor that is, 
in the film. So like with Edward and Edith, they have a scene before the Titanic where it's like, ooh, Edward and Edith are starting to like each other and like look at that, like everyone's at the beach and they're like kind of hanging out. And so when they're hanging out on the beach, they're like really not talking about anything. And there's like a good like two minutes of dialogue between them. And then they like point up to the sky and go, oh, look, there's Louis Blaireau, you know, flying over the English Channel, which is like a big moment in history, you know, in aviation, especially. And that's the end of the scene. There's no like actual true reaction like, whoa, look at that plane. Look how it's flying. Like, isn't that amazing that we have this technology? It's just, oh, look, he's flying. End of scene. <laughs> what, what, what is that? Yeah, again, it's just like forcing these historical events into a narrative. So it's just awkward and it's weird and it just doesn't work. And especially when you end a scene like that, where it's just this big moment in, in time, but they just don't really want to even show it. They just want to mention it. It's almost like they're checking off boxes. Like they wrote out 15 big things that happened in the past 35 years. And they're like, all right, let's fit this in the story. Let's check that box. Check that box. We're pretty good. We're good on that. We got that side of history told. Okay, we can move on to the next scene where we get to the Titanic and they die. All right, next scene. We got to get to World War One. It's like, oh my <laughs> God, it's exhausting. It's like yeah. not not only is it not entertaining, but it's exhausting to watch because you don't even know the characters. You're just getting like like yelled at about these like big events and it's like stop no stop for a second yeah let's just have human characters for like five seconds without it being involved with some historic event yeah definitely and like what's i think what's even more like frustrating and weird about it is that it's based off of you know london's history in, in england's history and it's a it's an american film and it's americanized so it's like the american audiences are supposed to like buy into it which I guess they did because this film was popular and did win the Best Picture Award. But again, like for us now watching it, it's like, why should we care about the Boer War? Like, you know, I know we should care about like World War One, and, and this is something that we touched upon in All Quiet on the Western Front is that we have an American viewpoint or an American creation behind it. But it's like in All Quiet on the Western Front is still through a German's perspective. And in this one, it's a, an American film in, for an American audience, but told through England's perspective. And for us today in 2020 to watch it, it's it's nothing. Uh, it, it doesn't like move the needle. At least for me, it doesn't move the needle. And I, I probably could speak for John that it doesn't move for him as well. That it's just like, who cares? Who cares that we're watching this? And who cares? Like, this is your reaction to it. And that happens consistently throughout the film like even with the death of queen victoria they make a huge like big deal that you're gonna watch this funeral procession that robert is at the is at the front of the funeral procession like leading queen victoria's body but you don't even see the procession you're just seeing the marriott and bridge family just standing there on the balcony just looking at it being like oh look there's robert and that's it who cares there's nothing visually stimulating about that yeah, no, no, you're exactly right. And I don't want to just say that it sounds like we're saying who cares about these huge historical events because they are really important. And especially for the audience at the time, like they're probably very significant because it was released in 1933. So you're having very up until the same year that the movie's coming out and all these historical events are probably very close to a lot of these people's hearts. So I think that's why it was like the highest grossing film of the year and so popular and and maybe eventually why it won Best Picture. And it just doesn't work, like especially when you look back at it now, like these events are really important and we should know about them. But, you know, that's what documentaries are for. That's what yeah. um, textbooks are for. And I think this was just a time really before some of these mediums that would be a better form of telling the story. It's just before that. So it really just doesn't work well now as a fiction film. And I did want to point out that Frank Lloyd is a British director. So that is something that um, uh, Winfield Sheehan uh, specifically wanted uh, in the director not uh, an american but someone who had a like english perspective on the film so i think that's where we get some of the specific like mannerisms and the language in the script that kind of works but at the same time yeah the whole film just doesn't work as a whole yeah it, again like it like great like it's directed by someone who's from the uk but then at the same time it's it's not it's for an american audience it's made by it's made by an american company and I'm sure like people, I don't know what the reaction could have been in England because we're focusing on like the American side of it, you know? And, and it, so yeah. And going back to what you're saying before, like we're not saying these moments aren't important, but they're not, it's not enough for us to 
to like really like sink our teeth into and this isn't the last time a film is going to be structured like that like a big one that 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 one best picture that stands out to, that stands out to me is like Forrest Gump like Forrest Gump does this same exact story structure where it's like look at this pop culture reference and look at this and this historical moment but it's like done really well and it's a movie that you can go back to and watch and like actually like recognize it and feel for it whereas like in Cavalcade it's just it's kind of like meh like you're not they're not reacting to it they're just seeing it happen at its beginning whereas in a film like Forrest Gump there is some reaction to different events there are some consequences of maybe Forrest's interaction with it and um it, it it just works way better than a film like this. Even a film like Cimarron works way better because, again, it's going through moments in history that are touched upon and that do impact the characters that you see on film. You don't see the impact of a lot of these scenes on film outside of the two sons' deaths, and even those aren't like that compelling. Man, Forrest Gump is such a good reference. I like, didn't even think <laughs> about that. Forrest yeah. Gump is such a good comparison to this. Not only I just I think it worked better since it's really focusing on one character through um, Forrest Gump's like perspective specifically, but he he is at these events like he's experiencing them. And not only is he directly at them, you directly see these events happening in history, but he's influencing in them. And I think that's why that film works so well is that he while it's a comedy. So I think it kind of works better in that genre. He it I mean, the film also does handle drama really, really well. Yeah. But he experiences these, but he also influences them. You know, he is such an important part in history. And it's so, like, well done the way they kind of piece it all together, the way he's kind of affecting Vietnam and he's affecting the, the kind of speech outside of the <laughs> memorial. Yeah, it, yeah it's Abby just, Hoffman's speech. Exactly, yeah. He just, he's influencing history. And here we just see characters reacting to history. And that's probably interesting maybe almost a hundred years ago when you were like fresh from these perspectives and you could relate to these characters relating to these tragic or crazy events. But now looking back at it, it's like, this is so uneventful because you're not even showing these important events. Yeah. And again, like it's the events aren't anything like too grand, like Luis Blair's light over the English channel. Like, is that really that significant of a moment in England's history is the Boer war. Like I understand like importance of it for you know, the countries in Africa that were, that were dealing with it, but for an English perspective, is that really like an important war to care about? I would actually think the revolutions in India or the revolutions in the Middle East, which are touched upon in later Best Picture winners, would have more of an impact on England's history rather than the Boer War, which they put a lot of emphasis on in the first act of the film. So earlier, Ben, we talked about how this film relates to some of the others with the kind of dichotomy dichotomy between the classes you know we have the bridge family which is the lower class the kind of help staff for the marriott family who's this very rich wealthy english family and eventually we get to see the bridges kind of leave and separate from the marriott family and kind of grow and become wealthy themselves especially by the end but a scene in particular that i really wanted to focus on is when uh, alfred bridges character is played by herbert munden who becomes an alcoholic after opening up this pub, you know, it's like their chance to be a business owner and to break out from just being, you know, a service staff and really have their own business. But all of a sudden we crash cut to the fact that Alfred is like drinking too much. The business is not going well because he's an alcoholic. And then eventually through this mishap of him going into the street, he gets run over by like a horse carriage and just dies. So it's this huge impactful moment that is just kind of you do experience this event, even though it's not like this big historical event, you do see it and you see his death and you see his reaction and you see his wife, Ellen Bridges reaction. But after that happens, you basically lose the bridge family, the bridges family for such a long time in the film. Like you don't see Ellen really come back after that beach scene where they're all kind of like hanging out as a family until the very last couple scenes. They're basically completely left out of this film after that scene. So how do you feel about Alfred's death and then as well as the entire Bridges family after that moment? So I felt like the Alfred storyline uh, for what happens after the war actually would have been a more compelling story itself because we could have been talking about the demise of a family that that was impacted by the war. I mean, you could, I guess, interpret that Alfred's drinking could have been because he has PTSD and that may, or he has, or he is going through financial troubles because of his drinking with the bar, but maybe that was caused because the bar was 
at first too much of financial burden on them. So you do have this like build up to like, oh, this is like kind of interesting that like they're fighting with each other and and he's become more of a mess than how he was originally shown, which is a little bit more proper and like put together and kind of and he was kind of like the most like lighthearted character at first. But then, yeah, when they kill him off, you lose the bridges for a while. And, you know, even then you feel like sort of bad in the following scene where you see Ellen and Fanny kind of on their own. But then it sort of then leads to Fanny becoming a star and how that that and then she gets with Joey and, and the Marriott family you know, again. So and, and and even that's nothing like too crazy. It's really weird and creepy with what they do with her character as she grows up older. But with Alfred, it like loses some of the interest that they were starting to go to uh, when they start to reveal that he's a drunk and that he can't necessarily keep it all together. Yeah, let's talk about Fanny. So Fanny is the child that we see kind of grow up from the Bridges' point of view, and then yeah, she's have... a baby at first in the beginning yeah, of the film. The let's just remember young. that she's a baby in eighteen ninety nine. Yeah, so you were very keen to kind of mark the years and kind of track her age, and I was a little bit clueless, clueless of that. Um, but then we have the other, um, we have the other sibling from the Marriott family, which is Joe, who we see as like a young boy in the very beginning of the film when the baby is born. So tell us a little bit about how that kind of progression in Fanny's age. Yeah, definitely. So in, so she's a little baby in 1899 in 1909, which is when Alfred dies. It's around 1908, 1909. So she's like nine or 10 years old, which, you know, may, it makes sense. She's, you know, this little kid doesn't know how to process some of the like craziness that's happening in her life. And then it time jumps to where Joey is in the military and he's at this big like banquet hall where it's like some gathering event party, whatever you want to call it. And he sees this, uh, this girl like singing and he's like so interested in her. And then he goes and he sneaks into her, to her dressing room. And this is some of that pre code era stuff that they were able to get away with. You know, they showed like at first we're not necessarily sure who this is, but it is Fanny. She's getting undressed. You see like, you know, and again, that's 1933, so it's pretty scandalous for pre-code. You see, like, almost, like, right up to the top of her thigh as she's getting undressed. So you see her almost in her underwear, and Joey's being this, like, voyeur in it. And that's, like, all well and good when it's an older woman and an older guy. And, like, even though it's still, like, creepy, but, like, that makes sense. But we are sexualizing someone, and I did the math trying to track it, who's 15, 16 years old. I don't I think that's a pretty big issue when you're sexualizing someone of that age and and it's and it's not that hard to like figure out because they they show her clearly as a baby in 1899 with time cards so there's no like maybe interpretation like oh she could be like 18 years old like no 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 she's definitely like 15 years old they're and they're sexualizing her by a guy who and Joey who has to at least be 18 years old and I think he's actually maybe 21 at this point so it's like you can't even chalk it up to like, oh, those were the times where people, you know, fell in love at a younger age. Like, no, 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 no. You are showing this young girl getting undressed. You are allowing a guy to creep on her and and, and be a, and you know, and have this like male gaze onto her body. And it's totally inappropriate. And then she like falls in love as if like nothing has happened. And it just like made it that much harder to like believe and to get into and and support, you know, in in the film because you're just like, this is really all creepy and bad. Ugh, it just really bothered me like <laughs> with that. Yeah, so not only do we have, again, another Best Picture winner in a row where we have a man just watching a woman change <laughs> yeah. or get ready in her, in her privacy, which should be her private room where she can do whatever she wants on her own. We have a man not only watching her, but yeah, she is supposed to be 15 at this age. I will note that the UK age of consent is 16, but still it's so awkward and uncomfortable, especially from our like American viewpoint where we're seeing this now in 2020 where we're which is watching this dude like undress and he basically gets caught. Like he's in her room to like say hello, but then he's like kind of like behind the door when she's trying to change and he's trying to like sneak out. So he's like trying to kind of do the good thing and leave, but then he gets caught. And then again, it's a scene where he's not only spying on her being creepy while she undresses, but the same way in grand hotel, they like instantly fall in love. Like what is up with these men writers these male writers that like think they need to write a woman just 
instantly falling in love with the guy. It's like their weird, creepy voyeurism fetish of like, as soon as you see me, you see how handsome I am, like you're going to fall in love. It doesn't matter if I was creeping behind your dressing door, dressing room door, like you're going to love this, this man right here. Like you instantly are going to love me. It's like, Oh God, it's so gross. It's the worst. Oh yeah. It's disgusting. And like even Joey's character, it's like, he, plays off as like this like little kid he's like he's very like mousy (laughs) in my eyes he's very just you know has this like tone that's just like he's very like high pitched and like oh look at me i'm joey i'm this like go charismatic like guy but in reality you're just like you're really annoying and you ask like too many questions and you give like too much lip to a lot of the adults in your life and you try to be this badass but you're really not that much of a badass in life so i don't really care about you and then when you do die it's like i don't even care that you died yeah, and again, when he does die, we'll get to that because that's kind of a perfect progression into the film that he just dies after going into war. His dad is there who's higher up in the war, and he must be on the front lines. And again, we just don't even see the war. We just see like these montages where we see these constant like fade in and fade out of random cuts of soldiers marching like exactly like on All Quiet on the Western Front, but just done not as well. And it's just like not even showing the war. And then all of a sudden we find out that this character dies through a telegram. Yeah. And it's like, oh my God, like, come on. Are you kidding me? Like, yeah, we don't it, even get like, you could have shot like a five minute scene where he's like stabbed and like dying in a fucking manhole. <laughs> and you see him like look at a photo of Fanny or something like something to like somewhat draw the emotion out of his death. But no, we get a woman fainting. It's like, come on. Like, you can't even give us like a simple entertainment out of just, uh, it's just so it's the worst. I hate it. And it's not even that he like dies, like on the front line, he dies in the front line right before the armistice is like put into effect. So it's like, Oh, if he didn't go back to war, he would have survived. Look at the irony of that situation. But, and it's just again, it's like one of those things that the screenwriters try to add in there. And it's just like, oh my god, like just look at this. Look how close they were to potentially have surviving. Like if Edward and Edith hadn't gone on that ship, maybe they would have survived. If Joey just hadn't gone back to war, and maybe he had waited another day or two or something. Because even then, like because he proposed to Fanny, like what if Fanny had accepted? Maybe he wouldn't have gone back right away. And it's just like, yeah, you know, like who cares? Who cares like about these characters and so like when there is consequence for them you don't it there's nothing to like really like sink your teeth into and you're just like okay like that happened can we get to the next scene already like what's next and then when you are at the end of the film you're just like i wasted two hours just watching people just react to things that i could have just watched on the history channel yeah i mean the only good thing about joe's death that we see in the film is uh jane marriott um or diana winyard's performance as she kind of walks through the parade for the end of the war and she's celebrating um around all these people but really in fact she's not celebrating she's just very sad from the the loss of her her child and now she has no children left after um one died in the titanic and one died in uh, world war one here so it is a interesting moment of her performance i think it's more just well done in terms of the direction the way you're kind of like following her throughout the crowd and then you kind of get a close-up at the very end where she's just she's like done she's kind of lost a will essentially and kind of broken down did you enjoy that kind of scene in the film yeah i think that that works uh i think again it's like another like just one moment where her performance is like good because she does kind of like let the emotions of everything kind of take over her and her just celebrating the fact that her husband's going to be back home and, and kind of just buying to the national pride of England that the war is over. Um, but yet again, it is a little weird that she's just like, it's like almost like zombie like person is walking through all the celebration and then she starts celebrating. It's, it's a little believable, but almost unbelievable that someone would even do that. Do that, yeah. But I think it makes a very compelling scene and a very compelling image to see this like insanely depressed woman surrounded by all these people celebrating. I've definitely seen that. I can't think of like a single reference of of uh, experiencing. Actually, the first thing that comes to my head is there's this particular scene where it's like a speed up scene of time in Breaking Bad where Jesse is at this point in his life where he's like really rich, I forget which season this is, but Jesse in Breaking Bad and he's just very depressed and sad. And I think it's after spoiler, after his um, one girlfriend dies in the show and you just kind of see him like kind of slowly break down and he's just so depressed while he's having all these parties like all the time. 
I think it's an int- interesting concept of a scene to kind of set a character apart from the world and show how much they've lost and how disconnected they are. So that's what, honestly is one of my favorite scenes in the entire movie, which is funny because there's no dialogue and maybe that's why it's one of my favorite <laughs> scenes in the movie. <laughs> and it's quick and like unconsequential and it, it, but again, like it doesn't like add anything too much to the story. Not like anything does in general adds too much to the story of the film. It's just, it's just again, like we touched upon, it's episodic. It's very segment. There are a lot of segments of the film that just happen, but not necessarily put together too well. I feel like I'm just like a broken record. It's just doing the same exact thing the last five Best Picture winners has done, except just putting it all together and it's just throwing it up, being like, here you go, audience this is what we have and everyone's just like clapping along like little monkeys being like oh yeah we love it so much and yeah it's more like yeah i remember this totally yeah awesome cool it's like yeah cool i remember that uh what else do you have for me but i guess audiences back then to be a little critical weren't as uh didn't have as much to like sink their teeth into of like things in pop culture it was very all new to them which is understandable Definitely. It's new for them. And it's just there weren't nearly as many films being released as they are nowadays, especially with streaming nowadays. There's just a constant flow of new content and you can watch content that's documentaries and you can watch you can even just go to the Internet and look up all these historical events like you don't need to sit down and watch a film to kind of piece together all these historical events. But back then it was definitely more telling just why this film is so popular back then, because it's just something that. They wanted to reminisce, not reminisce because that's not the proper word. Usually reminiscing is uh, looking back fondly, but it's just kind of to remember the history, remember to bring the people together in England to kind of show them how much we've been through and to keep pushing and moving forward and becoming um, better than. So I could totally see while it's really popular and we bring up the comparison again of the past five films that won Outstanding Picture. But what really struck out to me in terms of the visuals of the film is that Calvacade looks so much worse in terms of its just appearance on film. This film I looked up was preserved in 2002 by the Academy Film Archive. And I'm curious if you think maybe that's why, or if you noticed that the film looked a lot more, you know, it had a lot of grain, it had a lot more scratches and scars and running runners and lines throughout the entire film. I'm curious if it's because it was only restored or preserved 18 years ago. I wonder if that's the case. What do you think? Yeah, that, I think that's certainly possible that that was the case, um, which is unfortunate. But at the same time, is like, is that important to the experience? Because you would, I feel like if a film can be good, if even if it's like somewhat poor in its appearance, but if it's like done well from a story standpoint, you almost don't even like recognize it because you're so just drawn to the story that it becomes a part of it. And so this feels like a very like it was left behind in history almost for a reason. And this isn't a film that many people even talk about or even know about, even though it won best picture because it's just so stuck in its time uh, that it doesn't do anything that's wow. Or it stands out among these like early best picture winners. It's just there. Exactly. Yeah. I think it's really telling in terms of it being preserved in 2002, that it's something that, Maybe they didn't really find necessary until the early 2000s where it was necessary to preserve it just as a film. And it's definitely something you can't knock the film for. You know, you can't knock the film because there's scratches all throughout this preserved copy of Calvacade. Like you can't diminish the film in that way simply because it's not the filmmaker's fault. It's not the film's fault that it looks like it. That's just, you know, the age of a, a physical medium over a hundred year period. But again, I think that's more telling to the film itself and how it's grown and how people have kind of left it behind in a way over time, simply because I think there's better ways to learn about history, experience the history, and just grow from the history that's presented in this film. We've been walking through this film along the lines of its historical context and along the timeline, essentially, through history. And we've gotten up to the point where both of the sons have died in the Marriott family. We have the final scene is right after the kind of end of the war. And we see Jane Marriott's uh, sadness as she's going throughout the kind of celebration after the war ends. And really the final scene is between Robert, her husband, and just kind of celebrating the new year of 1933. And this is where the film becomes preachy beyond belief. Like the film is very preachy and has that kind of uh, stage play 
writing throughout the entire film. And as we talked about it, like the actors are kind of looking off almost as if the audience was there behind the camera. But I think the scene at the very end kind of finally seals how, I don't want to say pretentious, but how in your face and aggressive what they're trying to push onto the audience. And what we have is basically just the two husband and wife characters just talking back and forth to each other about how much they've been through, how much the world has changed, basically just trying to force an end to this movie. Um, Since there wasn't like a direct plot other than let's follow the 35 years of history. So I wanted to bring out the scene in particular, not only because it's the final scene, but it's also a big difference in between what happens in the play and what happens in the actual script. And I kind of wanted to compare the two and and, uh, find out what you think. Alrighty, so what I'm going to do is read just the last kind of couple sentences that they share together, both Robert and Jane at the very uh, end of the film here. And then I will show you what happens in the play version. Dear Robert, in one minute, it will be 1933. Well, Robert, what toast have you in mind for tonight? Something gay and original, I hope. No, just the future. Our old friend, the future. The future of England. But first of all, my dear, I drink to you. And I drink to you, Robert. Loyal and loving always. Now let's couple the future of England with the past of England. The glories, the victories, the triumphs that are over. And the sorrows that are over too. Let us drink to our sons who made part of the pattern, and to our hearts that died with them. Let us drink to the spirit of gallantry and courage that made a strange heaven out of an unbelievable hell. And let us drink to the hopes that one day this country of ours, which we love so much, will find dignity and greatness and peace again. So that is the direct kind of quote from the film that we have Robert and Jane share together. And it's, it's trying to piece everything together, you know, try to summarize how they've been affected by these experiences and piece together like the past and present and future of England and try to say like, hooray, like we're going to keep pushing forward and be better and better as a country and as a society. But what we see in the play is very different than what we have in the movie. Now we have the very kind of same speech, but after the and greatness and peace again, We have a couple extra lines in the play right here. But this poison gas gives us security. The world must disarm. The whole world's broke. We're all broke. God is a superstition. If he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul, in the strange illusion, chaos, and confusion, people seem to lose their way. Dignity, greatness, and peace. So it is extremely different. Oh yeah, yeah, da done. Very intense and extremely in your face in the in the actual playwright compared to the screenplay. So, what do you think about that difference there? I think it's uh, it's pretty poignant, and I they try to like sort of allude to some of those like themes and aspects. So they do like these, they do it twice. They do these like montages of like overlays of different people talking and different things. So they do that first, sort of with the World War One scenes, and then at the end when it it gets a little political and it kind of references some of the philosophical debates that was happening in the early in the early 1900s especially when you have the introduction of of communism uh into the political uh, playground uh so yeah like i it's very like in your face like we all need to change like the world is definitely broken and i think that resonates to today but the way it presents itself in the film it's sort of almost plays off all the tragedies it's like oh yeah those tragedies happen but we're here now and everything is going to be fine in the future which is all great and dandy for you for robert and jane to say as an old you know white couple living in the high class social life but for other people who have just gone through the depression who have gone through a war who are about to go into world war ii that will certainly fundamentally change so many aspects of the world uh it's not so different for them and it's actually a lot more painful for them so this film tries to kind of like sweep under the rug uh this last scene being like okay like i know it's all sad and like what happened to like their family and we're really supposed to feel for them but it's all okay because the future is going to be bright and dandy and great isn't it greatness and peace again yeah it's it's so political in the play, the way that it ends talking about poison gas giving them security and how the whole world must disarm and how the world is broke and God is not real. Like these are huge, huge statements that are not only political, but they're grandiose and talking about that God doesn't even exist, that yeah. everyone is all broke, that like 
we're going to rely on this new horrible poison gas, which I'm assuming they're referring to mustard gas. They do mention a poisonous gas in the film, but it's like this tiny little war scene that kind of randomly happens at the end. And it's not really clear what they're even talking about or how this poison gas will even help them in the war. The well, war's already over. So I'm, I'm not really sure what they're even referring to. Well, they're referring to like the, like the mustard gas that was used in the trenches, which went against like all uh, it's like, a, we like a thing now where warfare, you cannot use like that kind of gas uh to against your enemies because it is so bad and because like it it just like and, it, and it's going to be shown again in some future best picture winners where like the deformities of some of these world war world war one veterans had to go through and beyond just like losing a limb like losing stuff because of uh of, of chemicals in the air because of the gas and so this like the what's in the play like really plays into that where the poison gas it's like it gives you the security to not have to necessarily use guns and that kind of warfare in these wars but we have but then it goes on to say the world must disarm the world is broken like we're all broke because of what was used in world war one uh which we the whole world has vowed again to never use although and unfortunately has been used whether it's been napalm in the vietnam war whether it's been the gas chambers that were used by the nazis during world war ii and the holocaust uh it definitely doesn't go away, but I, I think that's what the gas, the poison gas is a reference to is what was used and what was used against each other in World War One. Well, I figured it was that, but it, this whole paragraph or sentence is really just convoluting because while they say, but this poison gives us security, mustard gas was used in 1915. It was used in the very beginning of World War II. We're now 15 years, 18 years beyond the start of using mustard gas. And not only do they say this will give us security moving forward, the next sentence is the world must disarm. Like, what, what are you talking about? It's like <laughs> yeah. saying the, it's great that we have a nuclear bomb, but no one buddy should have nuclear bombs. It's like, what the, What are you talking about? You're just contradicted yourself in two sentences back and forth to each other. This it sounds, like no a very, uh, sounds very political to today's world in America where we have nuclear weapons, but we tell people that they can't have nuclear weapons yeah it's it's, it's, just, it's, it's hypocritical so preachy it's, yeah, it, yeah it's very preachy and you know we don't know uh these writers and their political views per se and what you know how they were affiliated with certain stuff but um i think it's pretty obvious that there was probably some people who like really liked using the gas in the wars not good for them or for, or for many people but it's definitely very poignant to like point that out um, so I, I, it's curious to like why they like sort of left that out in the movie, in the film version of it. But then again, it's also very confusing why they would add some things into the film version of it and yeah. do things certain ways. So yeah, kind of glimmer of that is kind of retained where there's one scene where they talk about it. And then there's an, and also another scene close to the very end where you have all the, um, which I'm assuming wounded soldiers from World War One that are like making baskets i think yeah they're like blinded and some of them don't have the full like function or use of their limbs and i guess it's supposed to be political and sense of like oh look what some of the people like even though some people survived the war this is what they're still dealing with which is sort of like what alfred alfred's character is supposed to be where it's like oh yeah they survived but now look at what he's dealing with as a result of the war yeah it's just not cohesive and and connected you know it just feels like a bunch of random scenes kind of pieced together even that moment where they're trying to like expressly tell that there's there's just nothing specifically kind of alluding to that's what they're trying to say it's just kind of like mm, isn't this sad like don't you know people that are still blind from the mustard gas like oh darn it's fucked up war is fucked up but it's like yeah. doesn't even try as hard as it should to even push that narrative or that theme i completely agree it just it does the bare minimum and tries to do again like we're beating a dead horse but it does exactly what was done in wings and all quiet on the western front where it, like we get it like that like that's what you're trying to point to but it just doesn't work now because we've seen it before we've seen it before and we've seen it done much much better so ben and i did a lot of discussing on the actual title so it's a very interesting name with cavalcade you know it's a word we don't really hear too often and I wanted to discuss with Ben why we think it's called Cavalcade. We noticed that when watching the film, there is uh, kind of interludes or kind of sections of the film where you see not only the title cards indicating the years, but there is like a medieval cavalcade marching in the background. And we see kind of like it fade in and out the shot. 
And even the last shot of the film is a cavalcade in the sky. So we are trying to kind of put together maybe why this film is called Cavalcade. Is there kind of some specific reason why they named it or simply because they showed all these cavalcades kind of interluded in between these time frames? So what, what do you think, Ben? Yeah, I think it's supposed to play more into the glorification of like England's history because uh, the literal definition of cavalcade is a procession of people on horseback. And it's almost like a royal procession if you want to look at it that way. So you can look at it as like England feels, you know, it's very royal to look at uh, England that certain way. Like, look at these like moments in history and look how grand it, that it is for, for all these people. Um, so that's one way to look at it. You can look at it as like, look at how horrific all these like seemingly, you know, grand and royal things are for the people in the actual sense. But in reality, you're just seeing a parade of, of, of grand things of, of people on horsebacks on, on something royal, but actually isn't royal. That can be like one like big way to look at it from, uh, from a macro level but from a micro level there are each scene is sort of centered around these processions of people or just this like kind of moving along of time and moving people forward which necessarily doesn't make the that interesting but it is something that they use as a film uh as a storytelling technique uh for the film for me cavalcade is a little more of a a broader definition because while it is a procession or a parade on horseback i think when you take out that word of a parade is something that we're used to more in like a modern context. And I think for me, it was more to represent that a cavalcade is used for both the good and bad of life. You know, not only do we see this, this cavalcade of horses just trotting through in these random kind of shots that are kind of woven in from the, the timeline of the overall film, but there's uh, a lot of cavalcades or parades throughout the entire film. You know, when the queen dies before they go off to war, they're kind of outside of the ship and they're celebrating with like a band. And when they're on the beach, there's like a band in performance that they're out kind of celebrating life. And when they celebrate the end of the war, there's kind of a cavalcade. So there's kind of all these different cavalcades or parades throughout the entire film, even though we don't see all of them, they they're referenced off screen. Uh, to me, it was more so that it represents the ups and downs essentially that no matter what there's still kind of a gathering or grouping of people through the ups and downs of life and maybe i'm giving it too much credit because the film doesn't feel as nuanced as even that explanation of the title but that's kind of what i got from it i don't think you're giving i wouldn't say that you're giving the film too much credit but i feel like that through everything we've talked about with how the writing and the and the structure and the acting of the film is very poor it's it just like is there supposed to be really a significance to like the word cavalcade or are they just like slapping that name onto the top of the film and being like, look at this Royal procession of events in history and, and look how it all, you know, comes together. And it's like, but this isn't like anything that grand or Royal or really done well. This is just like, you trying to tell me that it is. And I think that's, and, and I think that's the issue with it is that it's trying to do something and trying to be something that it's not in the final product. Yeah, it almost feels a little piece together where they have those scenes of the the horses kind of marching and maybe they just kind of threw that in after the fact because they were like, what do we call this movie? It's just like a compilation of history. And they're like, oh, well, if we throw in these like scenes of cavalcade in between the years, then we'll kind of be like, oh, well, this film is a cavalcade where we're marching through time together. And this is what the film represents. And this is the best title because this film almost feels like a cavalcade that we're kind of uh, together on this journey through English history. But if only it was better, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I definitely agree. It, it's just like kind of slapped on there, and, and there's no grand theme or even a mention of like that of that word that really works. And even in today's world, like I've never really heard the term in use that would make sense of the word cavalcade. I've heard it in like certain. It's actually weird. I've heard it in like some sports references. But even then, it's like, that doesn't really make total sense why you would use that word. <laughs> it's like, mm. it's this word of like a bygone era. And even then, like when it's used in this point of history, it's like this still doesn't like necessarily make sense. But I guess it's forced in there. But again, you you don't really take too much out of it. There's too much substance behind it. Well, I think we did a good job summing up Cavalcade and um, oh, showing yeah. our positives and negatives of the film. I think it's time to jump right in to the sixth Academy Awards. Or sixth Oscars, if you're uh, Sidney Skolsky. Exactly. The sixth Academy Awards were held on March 16th, 1934 at the Ambassador Hotel 
and was hosted by Will Rogers. The Academy changed the eligibility year to match the calendar year from January to December. For the 6th Academy Awards, films from August 1932 through December 1933 were considered. So there were some uh, changes to this Oscars uh, ceremony, and one of them is the eligibility period. So this is the last time uh, up until actually 2020 where it would cover a essentially two-year period. So it would go from an August of 1932 to December 33 to then just any film that would come out in 1934 from January to December. And then in 2020, the eligibility period actually changed. It's the first time since 1934 where it's going to go from 2020 to a few months into 2021 because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So it, it's interesting that we're, that we're making that change. And there were some other uh, big changes that uh, we should probably touch on too, right, John? Yeah, definitely. And just one little touch on COVID. 1933 on June 6th was actually the first drive-in theater. So oh. there's, yeah, actually in Camden, New Jersey, the first drive-in theater was made. So a little reference to COVID and how this whole thing comes into a circle now here in 2020. But there are definitely a lot of changes here. Yeah. Most significant is the added assistant director nomination, bringing up the awards to 13 categories now. And we also announced the second and third place runner-ups in the categories, which was not previously done in the Academy Awards. So I think we can jump right in with a newest award, which is Best Assistant Director. Best Assistant Director went to Charles Barton, Paramount, Scott Beale, Universal, Charles Dorian, MGM, Fred Fox, United Artists, Gordon Hallingshead for Warner Brothers, Dewey Starkey for RKO, and William Tummel for 20th Century Fox, uh, which I think we have to like immediately talk about that, is that there are seven winners for Best Assistant Director out of a total of 18 nominees uh, for the category. So how do you feel first about just the amount of winners for that category? I think this is a great nod to the Assistant Director. I mean, for those who don't know, they're kind of the the figure lead under the director that keeps the schedule on track, really organizes the entire crew and acting staff to be on time, to, to run properly, to make sure shots don't go behind their running time because each shot and each kind of scene should have a specific set amount of time that they're allotted to make sure the production goes in order. So it is a huge role. And in fact, it's a category that I think should still exist till today. What's even harder is like, how do you specifically award the person you know is it the studios who are like these are the two best ad's because they turned in the films that were a week or two early than what they were supposed to so that makes them the best or like which specifically like how are they awarding these assistant directors based on their merits is it like the films that they helped uh, be a part of or what specifically is it is my biggest question and takeaway in terms of seven winners i i do think that's great because these are kind of like the unsung heroes of uh, the film industry and especially of just keeping a production uh, in a timely manner. So I do think these nominees and these winners totally deserve this award, but it is, it is a little odd that we're seeing so many winners. What do you think about that? Uh, I think it, I think it is very odd that they have it. I guess maybe they're trying to retroactively fix uh, something that they were trying to do, uh, which is praise the behind the scenes people, which is actually a big point of contention in today's Oscar world, because there is a lack of representation of some of the behind the scenes people, you know, you know, when, when it, stunt coordinators has been a big thing, absolutely, assistant directors could or should be recognized, casting directors are not recognized, you can go down the list, there's so many people who go into a film to make it, but yet, when we are talking about the Academy, it's not that many people who are being recognized, and we're probably putting too much emphasis on the on the big heads of the film, which, you know, they certainly deserve that praise, but there are a lot of people who put so much time and effort into something to make something really entertaining for the audience to take in. So it's really interesting that, that they would start this process really early on to honor best assistant directors and to award so many of them, but it's not continued as the history of the Academy progresses. Best Sound Recording, A Farewell to Arms by Franklin Hansen. So this is, again, an, another change here that we're seeing where no longer are we awarded the entire recording or sound recording uh, section of their studio. What we're seeing is a specific film awarded to a specific recording artist. How do you feel about that? 
I think it's uh, I think it's really great, and actually, what makes it really interesting for this year, especially, is because the only other person, like it was, there were three other films nominated for best sound recording, but they were all done by the same guy, Nathan uh, Levinson. Uh, so it's like he had three opportunities to win this award, but yet didn't even win it, and it went to Franklin uh, Hansen for *Farewell to Arms*. Uh, but Nathan Levinson does get his due uh, in 1942 for *Yankee Doodle Dandy* for uh, sound recording. But it is nice that, again, like they're finally recognizing the people behind it and not necessarily the entire uh, production company as a whole. Best short subject cartoon, The Three Little Pigs, Walt Disney and United Artists. This is a really significant simply because Walt Disney uh, has now been the first person to win a, a consecutive Oscar for the short subject for cartoons. So just a little interesting nod to someone who would go on and just still to this day has a huge impact on cinema and film history. Best live action short subject novelty goes to Krakatoa by Joe Rock and Educational Pictures. Best live action short subject comedy. So this is Harris, Lewis Brock and RKO Pictures. Best cinematography, A Farewell to Arms by Charles Lang. Best art direction went to Cavalcade, William S. Darling. So this is the first win for the film Cavalcade. And I actually have a a little like issue with it winning best art direction because I don't think there was like truly any great set design or art direction in this film. (laughs) Uh, Oh, come on. You got to give him more credit than that. Well, what what was the big set piece? What was the big like set piece in the background that was like, oh, that really adds to it. That really brings you Well, you got to, I think what is important is to define art direction. You know, art direction is every single detail that you really see on screen. We don't have like a best costume category yet. So we could have to kind of include best art direction with best costume. So we have like these amazing outfits in the film and we do have these pretty like big grandiose scenes where like we have the farewell to these characters that are going off to war or they're coming back to war. So I think those are pretty significant. Yeah. It's not significant enough to me because again, like we saw that we saw that in all quiet on the Western front and I can't remember. I, let me, let me check. Cause I don't remember it winning best art direction, but I could be wrong. Um, no, it didn't. It didn't win best art direction, but all, but Simmerin did. And I actually liked, that was like the one thing I liked about that film because it played into the actual design of the movie where it actually told a story through Oklahoma, you know, it's rise and, and, and modernization of it. But in Cavalcade, we don't really see a transformation of England. We just see a transformation of the people. Yeah, you, I mean, you are right to a degree. I will agree with you that we don't see enough of England, especially for such a beautiful city with such amazing architecture. We don't see enough. I think most of this film is filmed on back lots or stages. So, yeah, I could agree with you on that point that we don't get enough of the authentic London. We get like one shot of Big Ben, and that's probably the only actual shot of the city that we see throughout this entire film. So I could agree with that. They do my boy wrong, Big Ben. They got to show him more. Yeah, they got to show Big Ben. <laughs> Best adaptation goes to Little Women, Victor Herman, and Sarah Y. Mason, based on the novel by Louisa May Alcott. Yeah, so this is a an adaptation of a film that has been done many, many times based off of a book that is, I would say, universally loved. I read the book, and I'm not like the biggest fan of it because it falls into that trap that Cavalcade is where it's like all the stuff happens and it's pretty boring. <laughs> Uh, all the events in the in the novel, but it is part of the zeitgeist of of culture, especially American culture. The book. Uh, so, how do you feel about like this being the first time that the Little Women would be would win for an Oscar? But it's not even the last time would he be recognized for an Oscar. Little Women has been adapted many times. In fact, in 2019 was the fifth adaptation of Little Women, and it's always seemed to be a very character driven piece of the the five main women in the film and they use a heavy resource of very famous actors Um, for instance we'll see that Catherine Hepburn is actually Joe the main character of Little Women so it is kind of like a historical nod especially since we're now here in the future where in in 2019 we've seen an adaptation best original story one way passage written by Robert Lord best actress goes to Catherine Hepburn in Morning Glory as Eva Lovelace Now, as we mentioned, she was also in Little Women, and 
little uh, insider future prediction here. I think she might go on to win a couple more Best Actress awards, if I had to guess. Yeah, I think three more for a total of four, <laughs> which is the most by any actor or actress ever, I think is the so actual might see number. Her again. Yeah, yeah, we might see her again. Uh, <laughs> but it's actually pretty significant because she's not in any Best Picture winners. Um, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, so yeah, so this is the first time Catherine Hepburn is uh, properly recognized for her work. Uh, but the person who wasn't recognized it was Diana Winyard for Cavalcade. Do you think she had any kind of resume or chance to even win this without having necessarily seen a Catherine Hepburn performance in Morning Glory? I think she does a lot of the heavy lifting in Cavalcade. Now, I don't think that makes it the best actress for the entire year. But I think she does have a lot of weight on her in Cavalcade, and she does kind of carry the heavy moments. But no, I think more so on the writing standpoint, there's just not enough room for her to be considered uh, best actress in my point of view. Yeah, I would agree. She's not anything of significance for me to truly latch onto it and say this is a best actress performance. Best actor went to Charles Lawton for The Private Life of Henry VIII. I think there's a lot to say about Charles Lawton. The first thing is that Daniel Day-Lewis cites him as being this like great actor and sort of an influence. So he says he was probably the greatest film actor who came from that period of time. He had something quite remarkable, his generosity as an actor. He fed himself into that work. And as an actor, you cannot take your eyes off of him. And he would then go on to be in two years later in the Best Picture winner, Mutiny on the Bounty, and play probably one of the most villainous roles ever in film as Captain Bly. And uh, John, when you get there, you'll understand what Daniel Day-Lewis is saying about his generosity to the other actors, because he really pl- goes into that role and he really lets the other actors play off of him so well. Yeah, he almost appears to be like this iconic character actor who's really dives deep into his roles where you kind of lose sight of who he actually is, yet you still recognize him as Charles Lawton, and he will go on to considerably be connected to the film industry and especially to the Oscars here, even with Spartacus in 1960. Best Director goes to Frank Lloyd for Cavalcade. Frank Lloyd would also go on to direct the 1935 Best Picture winner, spoiler, Mutiny on the Bounty. Do you think he earned this award for Cavalcade? Do you think he brought that picture together to make it uh, worthy of uh, Best Director? I I really feel like saying no to it just because there was so much that we took out of the film that we just didn't like. And I think that does fall upon the shoulders of the director. And I think that I think that some of it is also the screenwriting and. But then again, also it's him trying to get it out of the actors. So I feel like he fails in this uh in this moment for cavalcade but then when you did mention mutiny on the bounty which is a way from a technical standpoint and acting standpoint a way better uh or well put together film than cavalcade that works and flows throughout uh so i don't think it's necessarily worthy um but it's certainly interesting that uh that he did win over the other two uh nominees in that category Yeah, we see Frank Capra, who's definitely significant in the Oscars and the film industry. We'll see a name kind of continue to pop up. We'll see his name in the next episode, actually. Exactly. And then we also have George Kakor, who directed Little Women. And he was also the original director for Gone with the Wind, who was then eventually fired. So he also has a lot of big names under his belt. So when you're looking back at this, it's it's really hard to say. All these directors have had very significant films, even with Frank Lloyd winning two best pictures so i think it's it's worthy simply the way he kind of brings the whole film together while we don't like the film and we don't think it really works as a whole i think it's it should be still considered as like a feat of how many different kind of elements he brought together i just wish it was a better film and it's probably worthy for a different director here yeah it's definitely quite possible it's just different ways of looking at it but there actually is one other thing to talk about with this category and when we think about gaffes in oscar history i think the main one we all go to is what happened in 2017 with moonlight and la la land but that wasn't the first time that someone made a gaffe of announcing the the winner for a category so will Rogers presented the award for best director he simply announced come up and get it frank which led to Frank Capra going up to the podium, but then it was then said, no, this is for Frank Lloyd, 
Uh, so that was the gaffe. And then to sort of like kind of downplay it, they also invited George Accord to the stage uh, with the two Franks to kind of all be up there. But uh, it, it's definitely not new what happened in 2017 where there's a gaffe with the announcing of a winner. Yeah, come on. How do you not know that there's another Frank in the yeah. nominee? Why are you just saying Frank? <laughs> come on, Will Rogers. He must have just been drunk or something. <laughs> <laughs> like most people at these award shows. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Outstanding production. Nominees are State Fair, Smiling Through, She Done Him Wrong, The Private Life of Henry VIII, Little Women, Lady for a Day, I Am a Fugitive from a Chain Gang, A Farewell to Arms, 42nd Street, and the winner of the 1932-33 Best Picture Academy Award is Cavalcade, going to Winfield Sheehan for the Fox Film Company. So before we get into like that question we'd love to always answer about if it's worthy or not, uh, let's jump to, to some uh, simple numbers on these films. So Cavalcade has the lowest rating on IMDb of all these nominees at a 5.8. Uh, on Rotten Tomatoes, it has a 59 percentage with a 5.91 critics rating out of 10. The audience score is a 26%. The audience score out of 5 is a 2.75. So, John, what is your score for Cavalcade? I gave Cavalcade a 45 out of 100, Ooh. and that is in relation to Grand Hotel, which was at a 40, a little bit below there. And my lowest is the Broadway Melody, which is a 30. So I think it's pretty clear, but I gave it a 45 simply because I just don't think it's well constructed uh, as a film enough to kind of really stand out from the rest. You know, I, I see these other nominations for Best Picture, and it is really interesting that there's 10 films here. This is probably the most that we've seen so far nominated for Outstanding Production, and I've heard such good things about uh, The Private Life of Henry uh, the Seventh and how um, influential the lead actor is, and Charles Lawton, how influential he is as uh, the character of Henry the Seventh, And then we also have Little Women, which is so influential to just film history in general like we've seen five adaptations of it and we have frank capra's lady for a day and 42nd street which is this supposedly phenomenal musical from 1933 i just had to give it a lower rating i wish there was just more to offer in cavalcade that was just more than the history unfolded in front yeah i, I certainly agree with all those points uh, i gave it a 50 and even after this conversation, I want to lower it, but I gave it a 50. It's not all there. The structure is pretty poor. The, the acting is poor. Why I gave it a 50, I don't know. I guess I was like feeling sort of bad for it. And I wanted to give it some kind of like valuable rating over some other films that would go on to win. Uh, but even then, I still even question it. But I'm going to stick with it at a 50 uh, for Cavalcade, which brings our averages right now of these Best Picture winners out of six films. I have a 63.3 average rating and you have a 55. So obviously, so far, uh, kind of going back to the way beginning of this podcast, how do you feel that like these first six Best Picture winners are pretty low in terms of how we actually feel in our ratings of it? Yeah, they are low. I mean, All Quiet on the Western Front is my highest right now at 85 and you have it as a 96. It is the film that it's, I probably have thought about the most since watching. That's usually a good indication for me personally of how much it really stuck with me and how much it's really affected me personally. So I just hope that uh, we're looking up and beyond from here. You know, we get something that's a little more character driven. We're moving away from a silent era and we're moving into just a, a more in-depth filmmaking process, I think, and a more involved process and really diving deeper into the characters here instead of just telling an overall arcing story that just is something that the audience can relate to. We, we're going to dive into hopefully topics and films that are more concentrated and really pull more subtext out of the film. Yeah, I certainly agree. I think that some of it is just due to time and that some of these films just either haven't aged well or they were made in a time that necessarily, you know, for a film like the Broadway Melody where the technology of sound recording isn't wasn't there at its fullest. Uh, so it is a little disappointing that, you know, we're starting to look that we want to like evaluate this group of best picture winners and as a whole but then these like first few ones are either problematic or there's just not enough there to like truly get into it. But I can promise you, John, that the next few ones and and as we keep on progressing through the years, they do they definitely do get better. Uh, but we just have to stick through some of these early parts because they can be quite up and down. 
John, let's answer that lovely question of, is Cavalcade worthy of the 1932-33 Best Picture Award? No. (laughs) (laughs) Yep, I think that's all we have to say is I agree is no, that it is not worthy of that award. And I think that this whole podcast has pretty much touched on why we feel that way. Usually when we say our opinion, it's usually based on our previous discussion of the film, you know, going through and diving it. We don't normally kind of have references of the other nominees, simply just we don't have enough time to dive into like nine other films. I wish we did. Hopefully we can maybe in the future. But there is actually some films from around this era. Uh, Right now it is the spooky season of October. So I'm diving into a bunch of different uh, horror films, some classics. Um, And what I've watched is uh, Dracula and the Invisible Man and The Mummy, which all take place from 1931, starting with Dracula. And then the same year that Cavalcade was released, we had The Mummy. And The Mummy is awesome. The Mummy is so cool. It's super innovative in not only its cinematography, but the way that we reveal The Mummy in the opening scene as a character. And I like care for some of the characters in the film. It is a little gaudy and and corny in today's standards in terms of special effects, but it is a way more compelling film than Cavalcade, and it's way more iconic. All three of these characters will go on and have their own adaptations continuously and will impact film history from 1933 even up until 2020 where we have the remake of The Invisible Man. Like These characters are still very relevant and prominent, and I can't go through 1933 without mentioning the original King Kong which is, again, another film series that has been adapted and brought to the screen in so many different varieties that it shows how impactful the 1933 iteration of King Kong was. So it's it's hard not to say no and say that this is not worthy looking at these other films that were, you know, at this kind of level and category. Yeah, I definitely agree. It's it's really odd that, well, actually, I shouldn't say that's odd. It's obvious that the academy is never going to truly recognize horror films even though a movie like silence of the lambs does win best picture in the early 90s it's still like we still don't recognize some of the greatness of some of these horror films uh, throughout the years whether it be these early films or whether they be modern films that are based in the horror genre it's just something the academy refuses or does not like to invest a nomination or win into which is unfortunate because When we do talk about what is an Oscar-worthy film, we're talking about what fits the criteria of a preconceived notion and standards of the Oscars, where a film should be Oscar-worthy just because it's a good film, not because it talks about war, talks about love, talks about death, or whatever that many of these early winners and Best Picture winners overall would go on to talk about. Certainly, certainly. Yeah, I think this was a good discussion just to kind of sum up the overall previous five films that we've seen, sum up the the Academy and how it's growing. You know, we get the nod to the Oscar. You know, we've been saying Oscar, Oscar worthy, all these different references. We finally get to the moment where we're starting to see the Oscars in the newspaper and we're seeing this cultural zeitgeist behind all the actors that we experienced and the influence of actors like in Grand Hotel that we've talked about previous It's showing that the film industry is continuing to grow. We're still continuing to learn from our mistakes and we're going to go up and beyond from here. And in the wise words of Robert Marriott to our old friend, the future. And that is where we believe this episode of worthy. The next few episodes will definitely tackle some much bigger films that will not be as I think sour on like we were with cavalcade. So I'm Ben and I'm John and this is worthy. Thanks for listening to Worthy, the breakdown of every Best Picture winner from past to present. You can listen to us wherever you get your podcasts. Check us out on Instagram at Worthy Podcast, on Twitter at Worthy Pod, and on Facebook at Worthy Podcast. Any inquiries can be submitted to worthysubmissions at gmail.com. Again, that's worthysubmissions at gmail.com.